Hello, hi everybody. Sorry for the small delay. Well, as you can see in the slides, uh, my name is uh, Enrique Lopez Manos, and I'm going to be talking today about Android High Performance. Since this is a DroidCon, I'm assuming that most of you have already experience with, uh, with Android. I will not start this question, who's developing with Android and so. And just uh, my one minute ego slide, I'm an indie dev. In my career, I went through different nominations. At the beginning, I said I'm a programmer, but then people think that's not serious. Then I said consultant, and then I think, oh, but you don't have any nice suit. And I think indie dev is the thing that fits better. I'm a freelance developer. I'm part of the Google Developer Expert crew, and this is my Twitter account. If you want to ask me any question, I will post these slides later. And I came from the, a city in northern Italy, Monaco di Baviera, not far away from here. And um, well, how did uh, everything start it about um, Android high performance? Almost a year ago, I was approached by, by Pack Publishing, and they asked me if I wanted to write a book on Android high performance. This is one from here. At that time, I was slightly worried because I, I thought I was always working with applications that were performant, but when it came to high performance, I was thinking what that exactly means. It means doing things maybe faster, more efficiently. Was that exactly? So I, I went through a process of exactly defining it. Um, at the beginning, the answer for me was not clear. Also, writing a book, I think, is an amazing process because you always have ideas or preconcepts of how to do things. And when you're writing a book, you need to write open source code, you need to check that uh, it's not only compiling, you know, it's going to be exposed, many people is going to be check uh, checking it, and you're constantly battling your own assumptions. So in the, in the process of defining it, I ended up into um, the question to what's performance, and the answer was, how will a person, a machine, etc., does or perform a piece of work or an activity? That's the Cambridge definition. When it comes to um, um, software, is uh, you, we have to adapt the definition a little bit, and it's always about the strategies we use to create software that is efficient. In the case of the mobile platforms, we know that we have a software that can be running in desktops, backends, databases that are different layers. But when it comes to phones, we have uh, some special attributes. We can think of energy and battery because a phone is not always connected to an energy source. It has a limited amount of, of energy. We need to uh, make the best out of it. It comes about, of the, it's also about programming patterns. When we are developing software, we basically want the software to last and to be efficient. Not, uh, we don't want to be developing something that uh, will not be maintainable in the future because that's not efficient either. It comes about layouts. If we're developing a mobile app, you know, we have this process of rendering frames into the mobile device, and that, that has a cost, that has a computational cost. We need to make it efficient. In, uh, in another, in browsers, even if we want to be uh, as efficient as possible, we might have some permissions to do things uh, slightly differently. But in a mobile phone, it's critical that we ensure that the response comes uh, immediately and the user doesn't have to wait, etc. It's about security. We don't want to have our, if you develop an um, application, sometimes you have tokens, and the tokens are exposed. And if we reverse engineer the app, it's very easy to access them, to access some of the uh, secrets we use to communicate with the servers, etc. It's also about multi-threading. When we are um, developing apps, generally we have different threads that are updating the information from a web service, presenting it to the screen, and um, there are different tools in the case of Android that help us to do this more efficiently. And of course, about debugging techniques. We all probably know how to debug. We go to Android Studio, click on debug instead of run, and we start uh, going through all the breakpoints, etc. but the Android ecosystem is much more extensive. We can do much more things than just clicking on, on debug and waiting to see, wait to see what happens. Why this is important? There are a few factors. One is the, <coughs> the user engagement. We want the user to be using our app and not the app of the, our competitor. It's about cost. One thing that changed my professional career a lot is when I started thinking and arguing in terms of money. As developers, 
probably you have uh, to deal with product owners and product managers. Sometimes there are these questions about, should I refactor? Should we do this in a different way? Normally, the product owners or people in uh, more political layers, they claim, ah, there is no time for that. When I started saying, instead of, this is going to take time, I said, this is going to cost money. Then I could see that people was having another opinion, because then it's not anymore that things are going to take longer, but they were assuming that this is going to cost money. I also think it's very efficient when you're going to do a, a you're, for example, performing code reviews and they take a long time. Instead of this is taking a long time, I like to came to the management layers and said, this pull request was just 2,000 euros, because we had uh, a few developers waiting and they could not work, etc. And then they start seeing like, hmm, things are not going to work out at the end of the trimester. It's maintenance also, which is connected with the cost directly. If um, developing something start take, starts taking more time, we're not having our software, we're not developing our software in an efficient way. And of course, about quality. At the top of everything, we want to offer the user a really nice user experience. There are a few costs that are uh, associated with this. One of them would be the, the financial loss from a lost business when we are trying to make business with a, with a company that they, or with a client and they don't hire us because uh, our software is not uh, performing as it should. Financial loss from customer reparations. You probably know the case of uh, some companies like uh, Sony and a few more. Um, at some point, happens from time to time. User data gets stolen and they need to pay reparations because uh, some hackers get the credit cards and they start making some payments and you, know, you need to, at the top of all the other costs like uh, emails and everything, they need to take money from the account and send it to the users. Uh, lost customers, you had a customer, something happens, they are not your customer anymore, more financial loss. Loss suits, that's uh, something that also happens from time to time when um, something terrible occurs and, and you need to uh, mitigate it through lawyers, etc. And something that is hard to measure but equally happens is the cost of a lower brand equity for your organization. When it comes to, uh, so, well, there are a few aspects in, uh, in uh, software performance. I will try to uh, tackle as much as I can in this presentation. When it comes to responsiveness, there are three important limits. One is 0 0.1 seconds. Everything that happens under 0 0.1 for the user, the user per receives this as something that happens instantly. There is no waiting process. The next limit is one second. More than one second, and the user starts perceiving that something is, uh, is going on, something is not uh, uh, happening as it should. And the last one is 10 seconds. More than 10 seconds, and you're uh, um, risking your user to go out of the application and installing it, etc. This is actually not my invention. This was a paper published by, uh, by these two guys in uh, uh, 1991, and it's really cool. I recommend you to, you can go to Google, download it, and they talk a lot about responsiveness and speed and how software should be reacting, etc. What this means in Android? What, what means A and R? Great, that was easy. So uh, that's when we get this uh, beautiful screen in the middle of the application, and it's very annoying, because the user has the, the choice of closing it or keeping it. And it's, it's unfortunate, because that's something easy to prevent if you know how. It happens when there has been no response for an input event, when we click on the screen for five seconds, but, and that's also, that's something that m I guess m most of the developers are not so aware, is when a broadcast receiver is still executing after 10 seconds. It's very easy to avoid if you know how. If you're using background, if you're performing background operations, you should show feedback continuously. We have this native element, progress bar. We can always create our custom ones, but you get the idea. We also have the pattern of a line, or we also can have the spinning circle. And we, the idea is that we should always show visual feedback to the user, not just performing the operation and waiting to pop up something. As developers, you're also a little bit of, uh, not UX designers, but behavior designers or behavior scientists. And you have to take decisions as well. If you're implementing something and that's something that you know it has a risk of taking some time, and access to the database, um, getting, fetching something from the, from the internet, 
you should always enforce in your organization, hey, we need to show feedback here, even if that was not planned from the beginning. More things on how to avoid it. This might be controversial, the splash screens. There was a um, few years ago an article by Cyril Motier about not using splash screens at all. Splash screens are not a standard Android UI pattern, but they might have an space because applications are not always, uh, uh, we always have some inherent situations and inherit, uh, inheritance in the process. It might be that we need to download a lot of data from the backend initially, that could happen because we have a, another model, a ground model, etc. And in this case, it's something that can actually be useful if it's well done. <clears throat> if you see this one from Vaporware, they are, this is a beautiful splash screen. They, they actually provide a nice feedback, interactive feedback to the user. Something like this is, is nice to show. Uber used to have another one as well, and <clears throat> those are things that is just not the, the splash screen that is static, but something that keeps the user engaged. <coughs> Sorry. And as well, if we are performing calculations, not just fetching something, but a calculation that might take a long time, we should use a worker thread. And of course, to debug it <coughs> and to uh, deal with those things, uh, there are two tools in Android called SysTrace and TraceView. Does uh, everybody know them? Who knows SysTrace and TraceView? Okay, most of you. If you don't know them, I also, after, when I'm attending talks, I like to take notes and then check things when it's finished. I, I think for those of you who haven't used them before, you should Google them and see how to, how to, how to actually start using those tools from here. In Android, we have the DDMS. Uh, I always forgot the name, but I wrote it here on the comments. It's Dalvik Debug Monitor Server. And it's a very powerful set of, uh, of uh, debugging tools that we can use to, to make sure that the application is working as it should. This is an, an ugly screenshot, including most of the, <coughs> most of the things that we can actually use. Um, here, uh, if we can see, we have the allocation tracker. If you see on the left from the file explorer, we can use it to see how much memory is actually being used on the application. There is also something fantastic. When I, personally, when I work with applications, I, I think that things are working out and everything is, is good until I open the allocation tracker. Because then I see that no matter how good I try, there is always things that are, you know, memory that is, uh, is staying uh, reminiscent into the, into the device memory. And I, that's something that, because software is very complex, no matter how good developer you are, this, this happens continuously. It's, I think it's a very good practice from time to time to go to the, the allocation tracker and see what's happening. Same for uh, the, uh, there is a network tool in the DMS. <coughs> Sometimes in software that is, is big, we, we don't, it's, it's hard to have the entire picture. So it's, uh, if we, from time to time, open these kind of tools and see exactly what our application is doing, it's something that levels up our game a lot. <clears throat> when it comes to networking, there is <clears throat> a few uh, nice tricks, not um, used uh, very commonly. And one of them would be, for example, to uh, set this when we are uh, making a network request. By using a technique like this, which is uh, setting a, a thread tag, later on, if we came to the network statistics section, this is only a, a green one, but uh, we see, if you see down, there is a red one. If we tag our sockets and our different network connections with this tool, we can also see which parts of the application are consuming more network uh, requests. That's, that's something that can be handy, because sometimes we think that, okay, what takes more network bandwidth? We would say downloaded media or this kind of thing. Sometimes could be maybe a process that you have to update on the background and you never thought when you implement it, but it has been growing since then, and it can give you a few surprises. I mentioned as well the layouts um, in, the, in the Android apps. Um, if we came to think what are a layout, when, how do they get updated? You know, we have the, the screen, things are being painted there. Television in uh, NTSC or PAL format, they update every 24 frames per second or 25. The new encoders and the slow motion devices can record at least at 48 frames per second. More general, if we want to achieve a really good uh, slow motion uh, uh, effect. And uh, still with those uh, rate frames, the blur can occur. When it comes into apps, it happens every 60 
60 frames per second of uh, refreshing rate. That means to put it on, a, to make the inverse mathematics, we need to ensure that the screen is being painted every 16 milliseconds, which is it's an ambitious thing when we have a demanding UI. This is the standard uh, tree, the standard hierarchy of an Android UX. Can you think of something here that can be out of the box improved? It could be, depending on the hierarchy, it could be flattened, but in all the UX, there is something that can be improved immediately. If you go to the top, there is something called the core view. The decor view is a placeholder for all the, all, the, all the Android screens. That means it's always going to be painted there. It makes sense, but do we really need it? Because in 99% of the apps, you have something that is covering it. So you will have something at the top of it. You don't need to make it visible. So one uh, improvement that you can make from the first minute is that to, to set this background as, uh, as null. So it will not be painted, and that's something that you're going to be saving on each, uh, each screen that you're going to be doing. In Android, we also have a few ways of uh, reducing layouts. This uh, might be, a, this one here could be a, a standard layout. We have an, an image view or a text view. Could be absolutely anything that we're going to be using continuously. And in Android, we have uh, two um, ways of uh, reduce layouts. One of them would be with the uh, include layout. Who does know the include uh, tag? OK, most of you as well. For those who not, um, sometimes we, or um, I, I was doing the same also at some time, we keep on uh, paying, uh, copy, copy pasting, et cetera, and that's something that uh, can lead to error, leads to time, leads uh, to problems, et cetera. By using this include, we just can create our own layout and uh, put it automatically in all, all the different ones that we need to use it. Think of a footer or a header or something that goes through our entire application. We also have our merge uh, um, tag. It's a slightly similar. Merge also takes care of uh, organizing the hierarchy if uh, we have some redundant elements, uh, et cetera. More things we can do. Here we have this view stuff class. Who knows view stuff? OK, I see that uh, here uh, not everybody knew this before. View stuff is cool because it's, uh, it can be added as a node. And uh, you can specify a layout reference, but nothing is going to be drawn on the screen until you do it on runtime using two different methods. So it can be very good to specify placeholder and only uh, inflate something when it's really needed, rather uh, than just putting our entire screen and then playing with visibility. That, that's computationally more expensive. We can call it either uh, with a view stuff.inflate. That's everything on runtime. Or setting the visibility. That would be something like in the following example. And that's also something that is going to save you computational cost. If uh, you're debugging UX, it's, uh, I guess most of you use it. But I know not everybody uses it. I'm, I work as a freelancer, and I play with uh, different companies. And when I saw how to use it, I get surprised because not, not everybody's into this. And this is very effective. If uh, a case where it's always super necessary is when you're working with list or with recycler views, because they're generally being inflated on runtime as well. Generally, you pull something from a, from a backend, then you paint it. And it's not until it's really there where you can see exactly what's, what's happening. And uh, you don't know uh, when you're actually developing. You need to see it on the screen. Also, a tool that I find uh, useful, this uh, particularly can be good for, for video games, but uh, it's. Uh, also something that you can benefit even in applications just so in uh, some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, corporate logic, is activating the GPU rendering of the developer options. If you remember in Android, you just can go to the uh, version number, I think, or version name. You have to click five times. You activate the developer options. You have a lot of things there. 
many things. And one of them is the GPU rendering. You have these codes here. They specify that the blue color is the time you need to draw uh, a frame. The purple one is the one you need to prepare the frame. The red, the one that is needed until it's processed. And the orange is the execution. And by attending at those colors, you could say, wow, I have a lot of uh, purple. So I'm doing something bad before I'm, it's actually getting painted. So pretty much uh, what I wrote here. Something that I like a lot is the, the memory. It's the ability to remember information, experiences, and people. And that's also a Cambridge definition. Let's talk about enumerations. Are enumerations good or bad? Uh, well, when you compile them, they, they might have some, uh, some particularity. There is a, well, that's what I'm going to show later. There is an annotation in Android that can help uh, go through that process and help us avoid enumerations. Enumerations per se are not bad. The problem is that they might take, they need to, uh, they need a little bit more extra space in memory because you actually save the variable and then the, the integer they represent, which is not tragic. And in 99% of the cases, it's not going to be, not going to have a significant impact on your app. But it might have it. And software is about handling complexity. It's not about, the hello world always works. It's, I go download the, Whatever SDK I make the hello world is going to work perfectly. The problem is when you start adding complexity. That's the real process of handling things so they don't get out of control and you can still work with them. And to serve that, it's a good idea from the beginning to be strict on what you develop. Anyway, here we have a classical enum, shape. We have a few shapes inside, rectangle, triangle, etc. This could be an alternative representation. We have a static uh, final uh, representation, so the rectangle would be zero, triangle one, etc. One problem that I, I'm, I'm aware of this is that this is more readable than this one, right? So this is like almost reading a, a book, and this you need to see the type and then the bar, uh, uh, value they have, etc. And uh, that's, for example, how you would call them. Uh, if you want to operate through this, this is uh, probably easier than sending an int, because you know exactly what they mean. And that would be the process of sending the int. If uh, uh, you have different values, maybe it could get a little bit more complex. How many people know the in-depth annotation? OK. That was introduced in, I don't remember exactly which uh, Android version, not so long ago. And it's a. Uh, an annotation that is useful to simplify the transition from enumeration into integer values. It tries to take the best of both worlds. So this is how uh, it would work out if we want to, uh, <coughs> to use the, we can see the tab, we have the, <coughs> the values described as uh, static uh, integers with its uh, numbers, 0, 1, et cetera. By calling the annotation and specifying the forms we have, we can actually get the best of both worlds. We're not using enums, which are less efficient when we want to compile them, and we still have the readability. And this is how this would work when we are um, actually working on functions. We would set the annotation with shape or whatever model we have, and the same when we're going to return a value. As I said, this is something that will not affect your life immediately, but is something that uh, can, in the long term, make some uh, slight impact. Uh, so a summary would be the enumerations create some unnecessary allocations. It should be good to avoid using them. And uh, the way to do it in Android would be by um, changing into static final integer values with the in-def annotation. Constants. Well, that's something that I guess uh, if you have read uh, uh, how is this book? the Effective Java. How many people read the book Effective Java? Okay, for those who know, you should do it. It's even if uh, now people are just doing more Kotlin than Java. Well, constant, you know, they should always be static and final. So they are taking advantage of actually how they are saved into memory. Some more things regarding memory. Strings. Are the strings good or bad? Well, they are necessary. 
but uh, they can be done better. This would be two ways on how we um, store strings. In the, the string objects are, by the way, immutable. So when we create a, a string uh, with a constructor, as in the upper example, we are forcing the allocation of two objects, the string example itself, and then the new string that we're creating. Not terrible either, but if you think, uh, also not only in Android, but in a backend where things are happening very fast and uh, sometimes you want to scale from, for many users, that could make some impact. So uh, something very, very, an immediate improvement we can have over this is to use string buffer. They're more efficient because they work individually at the array level. So uh, by doing this, we could actually save also some pieces of memory. We would make uh, the new stream buffer. We would uh, pass the whatever we want, this is. And then with append, we will uh, add it to the buffer that we have created previously. Also, one curiosity about this is that the, the stream buffers, they start with uh, 16 characters. So if we create a stream buffer and we have only nine characters or whatever under 16, we have some space that we're not using. When we go over seven, over 16, let's say 17, then it doubles and it doubles again. So 16, 32, 64, etc. If we have an idea of how much we need, we can uh, initialize it like, like this. We can uh, send uh, the amount of uh, characters we're expecting and we know that uh, the string will not uh, be having this uh, double behavior over time. More things, memory leaks. A memory leak is a type of resource leak that occurs when a computer programs, uh, is incorrectly managing the allocation in a way that the memory that has been reserved is uh, actually not being uh, free or released. This was a Wikipedia definition because it was not on the Cambridge Dictionary. And uh, well, some problems with memory leaks. Static fields. Can you see a problem in this code? Which problem? That's very right. So when we're using uh, static fields in uh, uh, objects like activity, we're always calling to some disaster. And memory leaks actually is a, it's a real problem. If, uh, as I said, if you really have time at some point and want to go to the, your, the uh, allocation tool in Android Studio, you will see that no matter which app you're working with, there, there are definitely memory leaks in, in almost all of them. Here, if we see one of the problems is that this is the constructor of a view uh, in, and, in the Android open source code. And as we see, we're sending the context all the time in the constructor. Every, t every time we create a view, the context is being set. So when we're creating them as a, as a, a static field, the, the context is passing there all the time and there is a mutual reference between the view and the, and the activity. Also another problem that happens very often is uh, when we are using non-static inner classes, the typical example of a, a scene task, even if nobody else would be using a scene task in 2017, but some people still do it. So does anybody can think of how this can be solved? Again? <laughs> exactly, that was the point. Well, the solution is weak references. It's something that I, I think is not something super well-known, but basically by default in Java, all the references are strong. That means when an object is referred by, by another object, even if they disappear and there is this reference between them both, they're, not, they're gonna be kept in memory because the garbage collector, how it works is, I'm gonna see for each object in memory if there is any reference and yeah, there is a reference, so they will stay there. And that can happen a lot. And believe me, it happens a lot. By using a weak reference, as in this piece of code, what we specify is that this field can be collected because it's weakly referenced. Threading. Threading is a method of hair removal originating in Asia. That was the Wikipedia definition. Uh, also, threading is the, the smallest sequence of program instructions that can be managed independently by a scheduler. That was another 
Wikipedia description. You know, when you go in Wikipedia, sometimes you have like threading can refer to many things. So, well, threading has a lot of things. We have, uh, in, in the case of Android, we have a syntax, loaders, uh, threads, uh, there are a bunch of tools. I think the point here is to know your where and what you're trying to solve. The asyntask is this old thing um, that happened since Android 1.6 or 5, and uh, well, it's basically to communicate the worker thread with the UI. The typical example is when we're downloading something from the internet and we don't want to block the UI and communicate this worker thread. As a rule of thumb, if you want to think, should I use uh, an asyntask? You need to ask yourself this question. Do I need to communicate with the UI? Do I need to notify the user? If the answer is no, you don't need an asyntask. So first, ask those two questions. And um, another thing that I also, uh, well, you know when you implement a asyntask, I have seen in many programs that all the parameters are void. You have these uh, three uh, templates that, that you can, uh, three parameters in the template that you can send. And sometimes I see in the code that they have void, void, void. And it's still an asyntask. But then you're only implementing the do in background, and then you don't need to create any asyntas. That's uh, it's not even over engineering. It's some using something that should not be there. The asyntas loader, that's maybe not as, uh, as well known as the asyntas. It's also used to fetch data. It has ex exactly the same features as the, as the asyntas, this uh, method do in background before the operation is being performed and after. And it's actually independent of the activity lifecycle and provides some data caching mechanism. This is how it would work. We can specify on the template the, the result we're going to be dealing with. And uh, in the case you want to keep it independent from the uh, activity lifecycle, as in as loader should be your friend. Services. Services are not threats. Many people think as a service, maybe because of the Unix wall, that uh, services are not threads. They are executing the UI thread by default. Um, you should never use them to start a long running operation, and they have their own life cycle as well, as in the activity. If you go to the documentation, you see that the services have uh, a life cycle as well. And uh, also the intent service, I think one of those things that is not very well known. They're a particular implementation of a service um, they execute, execute operations sequentially on the background. And one cool thing about them is that we don't need to handle the life cycle as opposite to the, to the services, where we need to handle it and see exactly in which state the services. And uh, we're running out of time, so we have the last part of the presentation, which is networking. Networking is the process of communication between different terminal nodes in order to exchange data. That was my definition because it was unfortunately not on the Wikipedia. Well, about networking, we, you probably use, uh, I don't know, um, there are a bunch of uh, libraries, retrofit you can use to interface with the web services, etc. When it comes to high performance, I think there are a bunch of things that are not out of the box provided by, by most of the engines and libraries in the, in the real world. I can think of one called latency gouging. Does anybody know what this means? Okay, this is a, actually a, something that can really improve how our application works and the user experience. When we are connected to a network, we have the option of being connected to the Wi-Fi, to the mobile. Uh, we know generally that the Wi-Fi will be faster. Uh, the mobile also can have a LTE or GPR, GPRS, etc. One strategy to make the application work more efficiently would be, okay, we're gonna distinguish now the amount of uh, the connection we have. And based on this, we're gonna take a decision. Do I need to download a lot of images or um, something that requires a lot of bandwidth? Well, absolutely don't do that if you're under GPRS, because you're gonna block the connection, that's gonna lead to user fr frustration. And as you can see, this is something easy to implement. You still need to adapt it to your architecture, but it's something that brings a benefit from the first minute. We can also batch connections. This is a tactic that um, has been used by um, engines like Google Analytics. And the idea under this is that making a HTTP connection takes uh, um, the first effort into negotiating the, the socket, opening it, getting the response, etc. And sometimes we're making this for something extremely small, just sending some very small updates. And 
it could be the case that we're consuming more bandwidth into opening connections and quitting them than in sending the actual data. So the analytics of Google, for example, they wait, they collect data until they have a big bunch, and then they send everything. That helps a lot to save bandwidth. And remember, in the mobile phones, we have these situations where phones can be uh, not under a Wi-Fi connection, I can be on the train, I can be on a connection of low connectivity. And providing those things, it's this, uh, for me, it's this point that moves from the, if, if you can say, technically, this application could be from zero to 10, I don't believe in the 10, but by applying those techniques, you can get close to the nine. We could prefetch data. We could combine them with the option of, uh, okay, I'm now connected in a Wi-Fi network or a network of high connectivity, then I'm gonna download things that I might need later, such as downloading media or downloading a big bunch of data that I'm, I will need to uh, use later. Um, especially if the connection is idle. Maybe the, um, I think uh, there Mike from the New York Times was here and I think they were doing something like when you are in the list of the news, in that section of the screen, the user is still watching the, the news, right? As they were scrolling, they were downloading the news. So when you click, you don't have to wait until they are downloading, downloaded. You can also queue connections by having something as simple as a, trans, as a queue where you uh, put the, stack the connections over each other and when the situation is good, um, throw all of them into, the, into your server. Uh, a classic one, caching responses, that's uh, actually I think that's one that uh, in most of the libraries you have at least some option of uh, caching them. So the idea be behind this is that uh, we don't want to, uh, to fetch things uh, uh, all the time, especially if not, we know they're not gonna change as much as we want. Last modified, this is something that can be done in connection with the server. So if we have a server before calling and see if there is new data, we can call to the server and say, with this, fed this header from here, last modified, it will return at Unix time, and then we can see, hey, do I, need, do I have something new, something new happen in the real world? If there is nothing, then I will not waste time and bandwidth trying to get it. I will just wait until something new is there. Oh. And last but not least, the exponential back off. Sometimes we're working and we get a 500 or four, if I get a 404 when I'm calling a web service, it's very likely that the next second there will be a 404 as well. So there is no reason to keep trying all the time. This is also a solution very easy to implement and the idea behind this is that if a connection didn't work out, instead of keep fetching data, I'm just gonna wait two, two units of time. If that keeps happening, I will wait four, eight, I will grow things exponentially until, let's say, 16 or 32 units. And that uh, avoids the user of being, um, I, I think, in, in Goodreads, I don't know if you know that application, I, I use it a lot to store books, and they have this problem that if something is not uh, working, they keep doing the request all the time, and it's very annoying because you cannot use the app if there is no connection, and it would be smart if uh, they realize, okay, the connection is off or the web service is, is not working, so there is no point in keep trying. Well, I'm running almost out of time. I would like to have your feedback. To me, it really helps. Uh, it helps me a lot in, uh, in uh, preparing next presentations and see what you think was good and, and not good. So if you send me your constructive feedback to this uh, short URL, bit.ly droidconit17, I will send you a copy of this book I wrote some time on how to find a uh, uh, an Android job or to find a candidate. I wrote it when I was uh, quitting my last company and at the company I used to hire people and then after I had to make interviews. So it was like, it was useful in both contexts. And well, still in time. Thanks a lot for being there. You've been a fantastic Italian public and international too. If you guys have any questions or something you would like to talk about, 